Welcome to our service this morning, whether listening or watching online via the GBC website or Facebook. With the change to the instructions issued by the government, we can no longer meet in church to record our services. So from now on, the different parts will be recorded at our home or gardens. And we are grateful to Dean for putting the services together for us. The worship has all been recorded before the latest instructions and the worship group are looking at other ways they can lead us without meeting up and we are very grateful to them all for this. Further to the announcements that Jeremy made last week, your first point of contact is via the GBC website grimsbybaptistchurch.co.uk and Facebook, search for Grimsby Baptist Church. So far, over 80 people and families have already registered on the website to keep in touch via email. If you have not already done so, please go to the website and the section titled Registration to Keep in Touch and register. This register will be used by us for urgent and important notices and requests and is necessary to participate in the future prayer meetings. If you have not received an email from the church, please can you check your junk files or spam folder just in case it has gone there instead. Our next prayer meeting is on Wednesday the 1st of April at 7.45. It will not be in church but on Zoom. Everyone who has registered will be sent an email invitation inviting you to attend and sign up and join the meeting and give you instructions on how to do this. Registration would also give you access to the members area of the website. On this there will be a version of the weekly bulletin produced by Brian as well as other news and prayer requests for the fellowship. Eric has set up a Facebook group called GBC Share and Care, which all help us to care for those in the church community who need urgent and important help or care. Through the deacons, house groups and other organisations, we are all here to help with any practical or spiritual help you may need. If no one has been in touch with you, please contact a deacon or someone else in the church to get a message to us. As we are not meeting together, this does not help our worship of giving. There are three things you can do. Go to the members section of the website where you can find our bank details and you can give by bank transfer. You can also go there and set up a direct debit or standing order. Or you can put your giving or envelopes to one side until we can meet again. The church building may be closed, but Grimsby Baptist Church most certainly isn't. Finally, I would like to welcome and thank Ross Ferguson, pastor of Lincoln Baptist Church, who is our preacher this morning. We are breaking today from our I Am series as Ross will be bringing us his message he prepared for this evening from Philemon. Come and stand before your maker Full of wonder, full of fear Come behold his power and glory Yet with confidence draw near for the one who holds the heavens and commands the stars above Is the God who bends to bless us with an unrelenting love Rejoice, come and lift your hands and raise your
children of the promise that be loved of the Lord, one with everlasting kindness, but with sacrificial blood, bringing reconciliation to a world that longs to know the affections of a father who will never let them go. Jesus carried up the hill. He has walked this path before us. He is walking with us still. Turning tragedy to triumph, turning agony to praise. There is blessing in the battle, so take heart and stand amazed. Rejoice when you cry to Him.
everyone. I hope that Rover, my friend here, was going to help me with my talk this morning, but he seems to be really upset. Uh, Rover, are you still upset? No. Oh, well, well why did you come out of your bag? You, you can't. You're not coming out. Oh, Rover, you're not shy, are you? No, you're not shy. Well, why won't you come out? You're practicing social distancing. Well, that's really good, Rover, and really important that we keep our two metres apart. But we're at home now, and we live together, so it doesn't matter, does it? Yeah, so you can come out. Oh, there we are, then. Oh, in your bag. There are your hand sanitizer. Have you put it on today? Yes, I've done that as well, so we need to really keep clean, don't we? And do everything we can. That's good. But uh, why were you so upset? You did something wrong. Oh, dear Rover. Really? Oh, that's really bad, Rover. You know, when we do bad things, it's called sin. That's right, and sin is what separates us from God. You know, and we need to ask God for forgiveness. Y you've done that. You've got it all sorted and it's in the bag. L literally, it's in the bag. Oh, well, what is it then? Oh, it's a bar of soap. You've asked God to wash your sins away. Well, that's really good. But I don't think you need soap. You've heard it's in really short supply and you just wanted to make sure that God had enough. Well, that's very kind and generous, but I think God will be all right on the soap front. But you know, washing is really, really important particularly at this time and we need to keep washing our hands all the time but when we wash it only cleans our outside doesn't it it hand cleans our hands and our bodies but it doesn't clean our inside and that's where God comes in because God can clean the inside when he takes our sins away and we ask him to forgive us you know today's sermon is about a guy called Onimisus and, or Animipus even, and um, it's about he did something that was bad, really bad, and God forgave him. And when God forgives us, he changes our lives. So that's really, really important, isn't it? it? It's so important. Now, this morning when you were really upset, you were crying, weren't you? Was that because you were so sad about the bad things that you did? No! You were sad about the things that you did, yes. But you were crying because you got soap in your eyes. Oh, Rover, never mind. Wash your eyes out and that'll make them better, won't it? You're going to do that. And remember, we need to keep washing our hands all the time. But most importantly, remember that God can take our sins away. And when he does that, he transforms us and makes us like new and we should never forget that God is always with us and always loves us now are you ready for your walkies <laughs> you are okay come on then let's go for walks before the children go out to junior church 
we would normally pray for them and for the lesson time with their teachers. Even though we are not meeting together and the children are not attending junior church, they are still really important to us. Margaret and the other junior church teachers are preparing each week videos, activities, crafts and questions for discussion which they are sharing on the GBC Facebook page for the children and youth to do. We want to encourage them and their families to use these to look into the day's teaching together. Let us pray. Dear Lord, we thank you for all the children and young people in our church. We pray that even though we may not be meeting together in the church building, they may still meet with you today. Thank you for all their teachers and we pray that you may speak to them today and be especially close to them at this time. Amen. I cast my mind to Calvary where Jesus bled and died for me I see his wounds, his hands, his feet My Saviour on that cursed tree His body bound and drenched in tears they laid him down in Joseph's tomb. The entrance sealed by heavy stone. Messiah still and all alone. Oh, praise the name of the
Let us come together for a time of prayer. Let us pray. Lord Jesus, we come to you at this time where the country and the world is in such a time of crisis. Things are changing so quickly and we find ourselves working in unusual places and different places and so much uncertainty. Lord, you are the God which is without time and beyond time who knows everything and who loves each one of us. We lift up our country and our world at this time and we pray that the government and the leaders and all those who have important decisions to make will be given the wisdom necessary to make these decisions well. Be with them, we pray. May they be well and strong and in a position 
to help not only us, but each other. At this time, there are so many facing un financial uncertainty with different changes in jobs or losing jobs or losing income. Lord, we pray that they may get the help that they need, that families will get the support that they need, and that you will be with them and close to them at this time. Also, at this time, people in our family and our church are apart. We can't see those that we love and we can't meet up as we are familiar with doing. Lord, we just pray for each one of us and all our families that though we may be apart, we can still be in touch and this crisis might provide and give us the reason to contact and speak more on the phone and be in touch in different ways than we were used to before. So many are at home, either working or parents with children, homeschooling. Lord, we just pray for these families in this uncertain time and this changed situation. Be with the parents as they prepare lessons and the children that they may be attentive and enjoy this time together. We really pray that the families through this time may come to know and to love each other in a much deeper and understanding way. Unfortunately, some families and some relationships are more difficult. This forced time together may be very, very difficult for them. We pray for all these people. We pray for those people where the relationships are strained and where there is stress and difficulties. We just pray that those people may grow together, learn to understand and tolerate and be closer together. We just pray that you will be with them. At this time, the students and new tribes have had to travel home. We just pray that their return home may be safe and uneventful, that they will remain healthy, and that at some time they may all be reunited back at the college. Staff as well have remained at the college. We just pray for them at this very difficult and different time. We really need to pray for all those in the NHS and the key workers. We just pray that they will have all that they need to do their jobs effectively. We pray that they will have the strength that they need to carry on, maybe doing repeated shifts day after day. We pray that you will protect them and keep them safe from the illness as they help and serve and minister to others. We pray that all the technical aspects like the equipment that they need we pray that they will have this so that they can do their job and when the tiredness is, is almost overwhelming we pray that you will just lift them up we pray that they will be close to you and that we know you will be close to them we also want to pray for people in our own fellowship we pray for barry Frey, who is in hospital and in isolation we pray for his sister Janice and all the family at this very difficult time. Also, to pray for Dale Wrigley. We want to pray for Morris Thornley. And Jonathan, Jonathan Hullen's mother is also uh, not very well. So we want to lift her up and also their family too. We thank and praise God that Stephen Poulson managed to have his operation yesterday. That was Wednesday and it went well and that he will make a good and a full recovery soon. Finally, let's just pray, let's lift each other up, so that this difficult time, we may know the transforming love and forgiveness that only you can give, and help us to witness to each other and to others who don't know you at this time. Amen.
This morning is the letter of Paul to Philemon. Paul, a prisoner of Christ Jesus, and Timothy, our brother. To Philemon, our beloved fellow worker, and Aphia, our sister, and Archippus, our fellow soldier, and the church in your house. Grace to you and peace from God, our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. I thank my God always when I remember you in my prayers, because I hear of your love and of the faith that you have towards the Lord Jesus and for all the saints. And I pray that the sharing of your faith may become effective for the full knowledge of every good thing that is in us for the sake of Christ. For I have derived much joy and comfort from your love, my brother because the hearts of the saints have been refreshed through you. Accordingly, though I am bold enough in Christ to command you to do what is required, yet for love's sake I prefer to appeal to you. I, Paul, an old man and now a prisoner also for Christ Jesus, I appeal to you for my child Onesimus, whose father I became in my imprisonment. Formerly he was useless to you, but now he is indeed useful to you and to me. I am sending him back to you, sending my very heart. I would have been glad to keep him with me in order that he might serve me on your behalf during my imprisonment for the gospel. But I prefer to do nothing without your consent, in order that your goodness might not be by compulsion, but of your own accord. For this, perhaps, is why he was parted from you for a while, that you might have him back forever, no longer as a bondservant, 
but more than a bond servant, as a beloved brother, especially to me, but how much more to you, both in the flesh and in the Lord. So if you consider me your partner, receive him as you would receive me. If he has wronged you at all or owes you anything, charge that to my account. I, Paul, write this with my own hand. I will repay it to say nothing of your owing me, even your own self. Yes, brother, I want some benefit from you in the Lord. Refresh my heart in Christ. Confident of your obedience, I write to you, knowing that you will do even more than I say. At the same time, prepare a guest room for me, for I am hoping that through your prayers I will be graciously given to you. Epaphras, my fellow prisoner in Christ Jesus, Jesus sends greetings to you. And so do Mark, Aristarchus, Demas and Luke, my fellow workers. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit. Amen. Hi, my name is Ross Ferguson. I'm the pastor of Lincoln Baptist Church and I'm really grateful uh, to technology so that I can preach today's sermon. And today we'll be heading to that wonderful letter of Philemon in the New Testament. Uh, so if you don't already have your Bibles with you, uh, go and get them and open them up to Philemon. You'll find it just before the book of Hebrews in the New Testament. As you turn there, let me try and set a scene for you uh, to the history behind this uh, little letter that we find in the New Testament. It was written in AD 60, <coughs> excuse me, it was written in AD 60 by the Apostle Paul, uh, most likely during his first imprisonment in Rome. Uh, during this time also the, the letters of Ephesians and Colossians would have both been written. Uh, Philemon is the shortest of these letters with uh, just 335 uh, Greek words. A, a couple of things that we're told in Colossians, one being that in Colossians chapter 4 we read that uh, this letter to Philemon would be delivered by two men. Uh, these two men would be Tychicus and Onesimus and we're going to hear a little bit more about Onesimus later. Uh, but we also read fairly early on in this letter that is co-written by Timothy, that young pastor that Paul has mentored and shared the gospel with. And so before we even delve into God's word here, these are a couple of things that you need to know. That it's a letter from Paul to Philemon, delivered by Tychicus and Onesimus and co-written by the young pastor Timothy. And we're going to begin by going uh, to verse 1 and if you've never heard me preach or, or even watched me online what I tend to do is take a few verses at a time, explain them and hopefully at the end of the sermon have some application points for you to take home and to think over. Uh, so we're heading to verse 1 in Philemon. Paul, a prisoner for Christ Jesus and Timothy our brother, to Philemon our beloved fellow worker and Aphia our sister, and Archippus our fellow soldier, and the church in your house. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, Paul uses the salutation here, Paul a prisoner for Christ Jesus, which is in fact the only time in his letters that he uses this salutation. He often uses the phrase apostle, Paul the apostle, uh, but there's a question here. Why does he use a prisoner for Christ Jesus in his letter to Philemon? Well, first of all, we know that he is in prison or rather under house arrest. And therefore, it is true that he is a prisoner. But why is he using this phrase? Uh, well, I would probably suggest to you that he is trying to engage the reader's sympathy to understand that this isn't the authoritative Paul that is writing, but this is the prisoner and servant of Christ Jesus. We read a little bit more in these verses that Philemon is who the reader will be, and he is a beloved fellow worker of the Apostle Paul. 
Now, we don't know a lot about Philemon in God's word, but we know in Old Testament and New Testament history that Philemon was a well-to-do man. Uh, He had great wealth and a vast household, and he was considered with great respect in the area. In verse 2, we read that he ran a house church, and he ran it alongside two other individuals. And these are Aphia, who most presume is the wife of Philemon, and Archippus. And again, we presume that Archippus is the son of Philemon. In fact, we know that in Colossians 4.17, Archippus is named as one who serves the Lord as a pastor of a church, and that church is in Laodicea. So what we have here is a family working together, a pastor providing God's word in terms of teaching and gospel ministry, a wife in terms of being able to look after a house church and serve through hospitality, and a son who is training and developing to move into ministry. And this is the family that the Apostle Paul writes to, not in an authoritative manner, but in a sympathetic manner, as prisoner for Christ Jesus. At the end of these introduction verses, we have Paul's usual grace and peace, something that he includes in all his letters, and it's a fairly common introduction. But grace and peace is the hallmark of the Lord that he serves. That is by his grace that he is able to serve and it is by the peace of God that he is able to cope as a prisoner for Christ. In essence, what we have in these first few verses is a picture perfect ministry family that Paul says in verse 22 that he longs to be with. But as with most of Paul's letters, he gives an introduction and then he heads into a time of thanksgiving. And we get the time of thanksgiving in verse 4. Just follow along with me. It says in verse 4, I thank my God always when I remember you in my prayers, because I hear of your love and of the faith that you have toward the Lord Jesus and for all the saints. Paul, even though he's in chains, is daily praying for his fellow workers in Jesus. And the reputation of Philemon precedes himself. He is known for love and he is known for his steadfast faith in Jesus, which leads Paul to thank God for him. Verse 6, And I pray that the sharing of your faith may be become more effective for the full knowledge of every good thing that is in us for the sake of Christ. Paul encourages uh, Philemon here to be effective in his bond of fellowship, uh, or in other words, be effective in how he loves and cares for other individuals as a pastor of a church. And he's to do so in the knowledge of Christ Jesus. He's not to do it in man-made love or some form of affection. He is to do it in the love of Christ Jesus. Verse 7, For I have derived much joy and comfort from your love my brother, because the hearts of the saints have been refreshed through you. I personally love how Paul writes his letters. He's stuck in chains, in prison for Jesus, and he is saying here that he is joyful. He is joyous because he has heard about the work that Philemon is doing and it has refreshed his soul. He's encouraged to know that his fellow workers are still working for Jesus, even though Paul can't get to them. I also want you to see here though, (coughs) excuse me, I also want you to see that he says, my brother. This is not uh, an authoritative apostle that is writing. This is a fellow worker. This is a, a brother in Christ. This is family writing to family. Now we've got the introduction and we've got the thanksgivings, we get to the main bulk of the letter, and that starts from verse 8. Again, read along with me. Accordingly, though I am bold enough in Christ to command you to do what is required, yet for love's sake I prefer to appeal to you. I, Paul, an old man and now a prisoner also for Christ Jesus. Paul has great boldness as a Christian, as we really all should. He has boldness to speak freely, frankly, and fearlessly to Philemon. Paul states that he could, with with all authority, as the apostle in charge of the area, command Philemon to do his request. But he doesn't want to do that, because remember, he's not writing in an authoritative way. He's writing in brotherly love. And so he 
uh, gets rid of his rights, or rather he humbles himself to the point without right of apostle, but rather just a mere servant, and appeals to the brotherly love of Philemon. Martin Luther puts it this way, Paul empties himself of rights to compel Philemon to also waive his rights. This wasn't about who's in charge. This was about two guys dealing with a situation because they love Jesus. Paul is not pulling rank. He is instead humbly requesting Philemon to understand the position that he is in. So what's the request? We find that in verse 10. I appeal to you for my child Onesimus, whose father I became in my imprisonment. Formerly he was useless to you, but now he is indeed useful to you and to me. I am sending him back to you, sending my very heart. Now Onesimus was a slave in the household of Philemon. He was characterised as an urban slave. And what that means is he essentially lived in the family home and served the family in Philemon's house. And it seems from verse 11 that he was pretty useless at his role, or certainly he wasn't very good at it. We also see later, if you just skip ahead to verse 18, that there is a, a potential that Philemon has had something stolen from him by Onesimus. And so we know from church history that Onesimus decides to flee the scene, uh, to leave the household of Philemon and to head to Rome. Uh, Rome had about 900,000 people living there at the time and so it was easy for Onesimus to hide. And he would need to hide because the punishment for a slave that is stolen from the household was flogging or branding or even in some severe cases, crucifixion. So this was a big deal. Onesimus had a secure role in the household of Philemon, but because of his behaviour, he had to flee into Rome and to save his life. Now, we don't know uh, much more about Onesimus and we don't really know about his travelling through Rome. We don't know when and how, but we know that he did meet up with Paul. God guides Onesimus, the runaway slave, to the Apostle Paul, who is in prison. And what is clear is that Onesimus changes his life. He turns his life around and sees Jesus as his Lord and Saviour. Paul describes him as a child of faith and he only ever does this when someone becomes a Christian through the teaching of Paul. So when Paul preached and Timothy heard, that young man who becomes a pastor heard the gospel, Paul says that Timothy is his son, is his child of faith. Here we have Onesimus the same. So somehow Onesimus finds Paul, Paul shares the gospel with him and Onesimus turns his life over to Christ. And Paul phrases here that he becomes useful to him. Maybe he's running errands or organising food parcels for when Paul is in prison. But what we read in verse 12 is a, is a change to the circumstance. Paul is going to send Onesimus back to Philemon. Now this would be a dangerous thing because Philemon has all rights to be able to punish him. But Onesimus is going back as a changed man. He's going back as a child of God. And so Paul describes here that he is sending his very heart back to Philemon. That yes, he is a slave, but more than that, he is a child of God. Verse 13. I would have been glad to keep him with me in order that he might serve me on your behalf during my imprisonment for the gospel. But I preferred to do nothing without your consent in order that your goodness might not be by compulsion, but of your own accord. For this perhaps is why he has parted from you for a while, that you might have him back forever, no longer as a bond servant, but more than a bond servant, as a beloved brother, especially to me and how much more to you, both in the flesh and in the Lord. Onesimus has clearly become useful to Paul in his ministry while he's in prison. <clears throat> However, Onesimus is to return to his master and seek forgiveness for the wrong that he has done. And here's Paul's big request. 
that Philemon would accept him and forgive him. More than that, he would then release him to the Apostle Paul so that they could continue in ministry together. And most significantly, Paul points out that Onesimus is now a child of God. He is now a brother in Christ to Philemon and therefore he should be regarded as so. He's more than just a, a bond servant. He is a brother in Christ. And as if to ward off any argument, Paul gives an endorsement to the changes that have been seen in Onesimus' life, that he can be trusted, that he is a changed man. Verse 17. So, if you consider me your partner, receive him as you would receive me. If he has wronged you at all or owes you anything, charge that to my account. I, Paul, write this with my own hand. I will repay it to say nothing of your owing me, even your own self. Yes, brother, I want some benefit from you in the Lord. Refresh my heart in Christ. Paul compels Philemon to treat Onesimus with the same love and respect that he would treat the apostle with. And it really is a great reminder of Galatians 3.28 that there is neither Jew nor Greek, neither slave nor free, male or female, for you're all one in Christ Jesus. When we accept Jesus as our personal Lord and Saviour, we are then equal with the rest of the brothers and sisters in his kingdom. And in this matter that's uh, of potential stealing, or maybe money has been stolen from Philemon, maybe it's a possession that's been stolen, Paul in love simply asked Philemon to do one thing, to charge it to the apostle's account. And Paul will pay it in full, no matter what the expense is. And Paul fully expects Philemon to be obedient. His character suggests it. He is one that loves Christ. He is one that is steadfast and faithful in his faith. And therefore, he is one to forgive and to set free. And Paul was encouraging Philemon to make peace with Onesimus, because God commands us to do that. Uh, Dick Lucas, a, a wonderful uh, writer and longtime uh, servant of God, says, We must live and suffer in this evil world, but we are called to be vigorous peacemakers. Whether that be in the family matters, whether that be in the political matters, or whether that be in global matters. Philemon and Onesimus are to have peace between them, and then Philemon and the Apostle Paul are to have peace between them. Verse 21. Confident of your obedience, I write to you, knowing that you will do even more than I say. At the same time, prepare a guest room for me, for I am hoping that through your prayers I will be graciously given to you. Epaphras, my fellow prisoner in Christ Jesus, sends greetings to you. And so do Mark, Aristarchus, Demas and Luke, my fellow workers. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit. I, I, I'm all, always in awe of the Apostle Paul. He is in chains, in prison. He is having the worst time in terms of his ability to serve and move about in Rome. Yet he is confident that one day he will visit Philemon again. So much so that he says, prepare me a room because there's a day that I will come and visit and will be encouraged by you. And he finishes his letter with the same grace he begins with, that grace of our Lord Jesus Christ that grants us the ability to serve him, to love him and to take care of his people. Now, we'd read pretty much nothing else about Onesimus in the New Testament. But again, church history can really help us here. And in fact, church history records a, a specific bishop to the church in Ephesus writing a letter in roughly 110 AD. So it's about 50 years after this letter to Philemon. In this letter, the bishop uses language from Philemon and references the pastor as Onesimus on 13 occasions. I think we can correctly assume from this letter from this bishop that Onesimus, once a runaway slave, has become the pastor of one of the greatest churches in history, the Church of Ephesus. More than that, we can find in church history, studied by F.F. F. Bruce, that he spent a long time 
gathering all of Paul's letters after he died and he collated them all into one place. So the fact that we are reading and teaching through Philemon and I've quoted from Galatians and I've mentioned Ephesians and Colossians is down to Onesimus, the pastor of the church of Ephesus who gathered them together. We also know in church history that he was martyred as a pastor because he refused to deny Jesus. I personally think this is an incredible story that we have a useless slave to a runaway slave to a child of God to a pastor of one of the the biggest churches in history to a martyr for Jesus Christ. It's a wonderful letter and I want to encourage you with some application points today and and what I mean by that is how are we going to take this this small short letter that Paul has written and apply it to our lives? In other words, how are we going to change this week based on what we have learnt in this letter? I have a few points for you and let me just go through them relatively quickly. Uh, Number one, we should be known for our Christian character. Did you notice that Paul was able to predict the reaction of Philemon? Did you notice that he was going to know how Philemon is going to react to the situation? People should talk about us in that way too. They should be able to see in us our Christian character. In the way we live and act, they'll be able to predict how we will respond, that we will respond differently from this world. And that response would honour Philippians 1.27, which says, Let your manner of life be worthy of the gospel of Christ. The issue is, that is near an impossible task. We're consistently tempted to sin and we're consistently tempted to wander away from God. Yet Paul, in his letter to Ephesians and to the church in Ephesus, writes a wonderful promise that we're not to do it on our own, but rather we are to rely on the Spirit to change how we live and to keep us on the straight and narrow. Ephesians chapter 5, verses 16 to 17 read this, say this, But I say, Walk by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. For the desires of the flesh are against the Spirit, and the desires of the Spirit are against the flesh. For these are opposed to each other, to keep you from doing the things you want to do. You see, if we live by the Spirit, then we will automatically die to self. But if we live for self, we will automatically forget about the Spirit. And so we're not to have a Christian character by our own human efforts. We're to have that character by the power of the Holy Spirit. And let me just encourage you that we're not going to get this right every time. In fact, it is clear that Onesimus ran from Philemon because he did fear a punishment. So we're not always going to get this right. But our role as children of God is to systematically work through our life with the power of the Holy Spirit so that all reflects the gospel and all reflects a Christian character. And my second point is that we should be useful for our master. Uh, There was once a day where I wasn't a pastor and I worked in recruitment. I worked in the finance district in London and also in Edinburgh. And in that environment, you aim for the top job. You aim to be the best. You aim to win the competitions and to uh, earn the company more and more money. Uh, Yet over the months and years as I've served God, I've recognised that God doesn't require me to have the top job. That God doesn't even require me to be the best in this world at something. Rather, God simply requires my usefulness. He requires my heart and a servant attitude. Uh, We read in Isaiah chapter 6 and verse 8, And I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send and who will go for us? Then I said, Here I am, send me. Notice that, that God doesn't describe to Isaiah the task that he has planned for him. He doesn't tell him whether it's preaching, whether it's cleaning the church, whether it's giving an encouraging word, whether it's giving off some of his wealth, whether it's just serving in the church. He doesn't tell him. Instead, God simply asks, who will serve me? Who will go on my behalf? Who will do my work? And if you notice the response of Isaiah, it was, I will. No questions asked, 
No agenda sought, no recognition needed. I'll serve the Lord, he says. And so I want to pose a very simple question that we learn from Onesimus' usefulness to the Apostle Paul. Are you useful for Jesus? Are you sharing the gospel? Are you spending time serving the Lord, even through this difficult time of coronavirus? Are you phoning your church members? Are you phoning your family and friends and sharing the gospel? Are you emailing encouragements to others? Uh, this week I've had wonderful phone calls with my church and it's so encouraging uh, to hear that in this hard times, we can still love one another through phone calls. We can still be useful for our Lord Jesus Christ. Are you being useful for your master? Finally, let me just take you to my third and final point. We should love one another. We should love one another. Love is the backbone, it's, it's the bedrock, it's, it's the foundation of the Christian life. We know in the greatest commandment that we are to love God and then we're to love others. And it's that love of God that flows through us that we are to flow outward towards others. And it dawned on me in recent months that this issue as to whether we love one another or not is something that will make or break a church. <clears throat> to be honest, it will make or break a Christian. You see, if we love Jesus and we wholeheartedly do, then we won't be compelled, <clears throat> excuse me, or feel duty to that outpouring. It will just happen in our lives. We will love others. When we lack in love for others, truth be told, we lack in love for Jesus. Every church has its issues. Every Christian will have their complicated issues in life. But I guarantee you, it will always fall down to, do you love Jesus? Do you love others? When we love, we share burdens, we forgive, we spur one another on, we comfort, we support, and we point to Jesus in all things. The lesson that we find in Philemon is not of a leader rebuking another church leader and not even of the Apostle Paul wanting his own way. Instead, what we see is an example of how to deal with matters in church and in life with love, with Christian character, and in usefulness for our Lord above all, because we love Jesus. Let me encourage you this week to be useful for Jesus by loving others and by encouraging others to serve him in any form of way. And as we, as the, the servants of Christ, spread the gospel through our land, I pray that at this hard and difficult time, that there'd be many people that would say this one phrase, I became a Christian when the coronavirus hit in 2020. Is that not what we want to hear this year? I encourage you to serve Jesus and let's hear that phrase more and more. Oh 
of Jesus, Savior and King. He is the cornerstone. Hallelujah. And now we stand as His church until the day when He comes in glory. Hallelujah. So we declare the praises of Jesus, Savior and King. He is the cornerstone, hallelujah. And now we stand as His church until the day when He comes in glory, hallelujah, Let us end our service this morning by saying the grace together. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us now and through this coming week and forevermore. Amen.